Welcome back out here to Somerset Place. We're actually standing in the former barnyard area where the shoemaker's shop once stood. Um, this structure was built sometime between 1819 and 1839 um, and would have uh, been where enslaved cobblers like Ned Houghton, Solomon, and Ishmael Harvey Jr. were manufacturing shoes for the enslaved community. And so this building was listed on the 1839 inventory and contained a number of items, including 26 lasts, these are devices that approximate a human foot so that uh, an enslaved cobbler like Solomon can actually make or repair shoes. And so the size uh, of the last is going to be dependent not only on the size of someone's foot, but also on the type of shoe that is being manufactured. And they're typically made out of wood or cast iron. Um, and so Ishmael uh, would have been forming leather around a last and then sewing the pieces together using an awl. And there were five awls inside of the shoemaker's shop in 1839. Um, this is a hand tool that has an attached needle, and so they're going to be puncturing holes in the leather, and as they do, um, it's going to be forming a lock stitch, which is very similar to uh, how a modern sewing machine works, actually. There's also a pair of pincers, uh, a hammer, and knives located in this building as well. And so when this plantation first started back in 1785 with the Lake Company, uh, the manufacturing of shoes was actually outsourced. So the Lake Company was purchasing supplies and then they hired a minimum of two full-time white cobblers uh, like Abner Wooten and John Courtney. Um, and so these men would have been manufacturing the shoes for the enslaved community. But this was a very costly method of manufacturing shoes. And so when Josiah Collins III moved here in 1830 and turned this into his personal estate, he reorganized the business and actually detailed enslaved artisans like Ned and Solomon and Ishmael to manufacture these shoes in-house. Um, this was much more cost-effective um, because it, it reduces the maintenance costs uh, and it allows Josiah's profit margins to increase. Um, and so enslaved people were issued uh, and rationed a pair of shoes each year. And so typically domestic enslaved persons like the butler Luke Davis, they were the ones who would be wearing these shoes year round uh, because their clothing was supposed to be presentable to the invited guests from the Collins family. And then field hands like Uriah Bennett, they would be wearing these shoes a little more sporadically. So at least in the winter time, uh, maybe into the spring uh, and early fall, um, but they likely would not have been wearing shoes uh, year round here. Um, and so uh, Ishmael, making all these shoes here, he would have to make 285 shoes in 1843 for the enslaved population, which then grew to 328 people in 1860. And so this would have been a full-time job for these enslaved cobblers. Um, now, Ishmael was actually hired out during the Civil War to the North Carolina Railroad Company as a way for Josiah III to make some more money. Um, and then when uh, Ishmael was free, when he reached emancipation in 1865, he would pursue uh, his uh, business as a free person. So he actually settled in the new town of Cresswell by 1880 um, and opened a, a shoemaking shop as well as sail making um, to supplement his income. And so he was maintaining this business through at least 1894, which is the last record that we have of Ishmael. Now, as for the shoemaker shop, we don't actually know what the ultimate disposition of that building was, um, but it would have been in use through at least the end of the Civil War. So that's a little bit about the shoemaker shop and uh, the enslaved cobblers here on this plantation. If you have any questions about this video, please comment below. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest videos, and then we hope to see you guys out here for a guided tour real soon. Thank you.